Okay, um, I want to talk about um, how you control um, local vasoconstriction and vasodilation. It's very important that you heard that I said the word local. I'm not talking about systemic vasoconstriction and vasodilation. I'm talking about local vasoconstriction and vasodilation. So let's say we have a capillary bed to the liver, for instance, and we want to control blood flow to that capillary bed without dramatically impacting blood flow for the rest of the body. This is called autoregulation or local regulation, and not surprisingly, it often involves paracrine agents, okay? Controlling local or intrinsic control of blood through capillary beds. So here's the deal. What I want to do is I want to cause local vasoconstriction and vasodilation, generally of an arterial, and that's how it control blood flow through a capillary bed. So at a given mean arterial pressure, organs or tissues can regulate blood, throw, blood flow through their own capillary beds. This does not involve nervous system or hormones because hormones would affect way more than just a local capillary bed and the nervous system generally does too. What it does involve is primarily paracrine factors um, controlling vasoconstriction and vasodilation. And um, although these may have a little bit of an impact on the mean arterial pressure, that's not really the point. That's really secondary. What I'm really trying to do is this liver capillary bed says it needs more blood. I do va uh, vasodilation of the arterioles leading to that capillary bed, and I'm not concerned about the impact it has on the blood pressure as a whole. Okay, so let's talk about two reasons, two ways that this local control of flow could occur. And one of them is called metabolic control, and then hopefully this one will make sense to you. And basically this says that if the tissues that the capillary bed is supply supplying give any of these signals, then you are going to release paracrine agents that will cause dilation. So if the tissue, and for instance, the liver capillary bed says, I have low oxygen, or I have high carbon dioxide, or I have low pH, high H plus, remember the relationship between carbon dioxide and pH, this will cause the release of paracrine agents that will activate dilation of arterioles, therefore increased perfusion, which is more blood flow to the area. Okay, so let's look at a figure that shows kind of the same thing. It doesn't say anything about pH, but if a tissue, this liver, right, has a really high metabolic rate because you took too much acetaminophen yesterday, okay, then um, the oxygen consumption goes up and the carbon dioxide production goes up. Everybody with me? And then the oxygen concentration will go down, yes, and the carbon dioxide concentration will go up, okay? Then what's going to happen is the local arteriolar smooth muscle will dilate, dropping the resistance, increasing the blood flow, increasing the oxygen delivery, increasing the carbon dioxide removal, whoop, feed that right back, okay? Now this is generally occurring because of paracrine agents that were released, okay? So this is called metabolic control. Okay, and then the next one is just pressure related. So um, capillaries can't really protect themselves. They don't really have any connective tissue in their wall and they don't really have any smooth muscle in their wall. So the arterioles need to protect them when the pressure starts increasing. This is called myogenic control. When high systemic blood pressure, perfusion pressure, stretches the wall of an arteriole, what does it do? Now, I want you to know that this is about protecting your capillaries. So if the arteriole gets stretched, what it actually does is remember, this, these situations are only about protecting my homies. And my homies are these capillaries and tissues that I am supplying in the liver. I'm not worried at all about body-wide homeostasis right now. I'm just concerned about my people. And my people are these hepatocytes and these capillaries in the liver. So if the pressure goes up, it stretches the arterial smooth muscle and the arterial smooth muscle goes, oh shit, my homies are in danger. And then what it does is constrict to protect those downstream capillary beds. Increases the pressure, increases the resistance, decreases the flow, and protects, okay? So this myogenic control is really about protecting your capillary bed. Okay, so 
what happens long term if, for instance, you continue to like give the message that um, I'm constantly high in carbon dioxide and low in oxygen because maybe you just started training for a marathon and your skeletal muscles are using up more oxygen and they're gener generating more ca carbon dioxide. Well, this is kind of a short-term fix, but the long-term fix would be that the existing vessels going to that tissue, maybe your skeletal muscle in your quadriceps femoris group, um, the long-term solution is the existing vessels can enlarge to deliver mud bl more blood flow. And you can also develop more capillaries in the area to have more collateral circulation in the area. So that's a long-term solution. Okay, so now let's talk about a few places in the body that really have sort of diametrically extreme needs for um, blood flow. Um, and again, we're talking about local blood flow needs here. Skeletal muscles are one of them. Skeletal muscles either need a reasonable amount of blood flow or an outrageous amount of blood flow. And so it's really dramatically different depending on whether you're using them right now or not. So skeletal muscles, the blood flow to skeletal muscles is extremely variable depending on the activity. So when you are exercising, you do what's called exercise hyperemia, which means I am really using a lot of oxygen, so give me tons of blood flow. The main stimulus for more blood flow in skeletal muscles, the main local stimulus, not talking about nervous system at all yet, we will later though, um, the main stimulus for a skeletal muscle to tell its local homey arterioles that it needs more is when it drops in oxygen content. So as soon as that skeletal muscle in your quadriceps femoris groups is really low in oxygen because you started training, um, it is going to release paracrine agents, which will say, please vas vasodilate and give me more. Okay, the brain is sort of the other extreme because the brain is relatively constant in its blood flow needs. And why is that? Well, the cranium is too rigid to handle excessive blood flow because there's no place to put excess pressure in there. And then um, your neurons really do not do any appreciable amount of anaerobic cellular respiration. So they're really intolerant of reduced blood flow or ischemia. So basically it can't tolerate too much and it can't tolerate too little. So the brain is really, really persnickety. And whenever the brain, interestingly, not whenever it encounters low oxygen does it release paracrine agents that cause vasodilation, but whenever it encounters low pH or high carbon dioxide, it does that long before um, it actually responds to the low oxygen levels. And why is that? We'll figure out through the respiratory and urinary system that the brain really has a crappy bu buffering system. So it's really, really subject to pH changes really quickly. So the main stimulus for the brain to release paracrine agents that tell its homey arterioles to dilate is whenever it detects low pH or high carbon dioxide long before it releases the same paracrine agents because it detected low oxygen. So it's really, really susceptible to these two. Okay, then we'll get into cardiac muscle tissue in the next section.